Superhumans, Boomer Anderson. We're back with another episode of the Decoding Superhuman podcast. As always, we want to bring on experts to separate really truth from crap and give you bite-sized pieces of actionable information that you can use in your everyday life to become more superhuman or simply just perform better. Now, one area, if you go back through the topics that we've covered on the podcast, which we haven't covered in detail, and I've been asked about many times, is mindfulness. And mindfulness is one of those areas which I've kind of shied away from because, well, one, actually the main issue is finding the right guest. And that right guest I actually met in Riga at the Biohacking Latvia conference. And he was presenting a couple people before me and I was absolutely blown away by his presentation. And the next day he absolutely blew the doors off the building with his workshop. And so my guest is Marco Lepic. And Marco is a corporate mindfulness and emotional agility coach with a prior background in strategic communications and consulting. He is also passionate about implementing neuroscience-based cognitive training tools in workplaces around the globe. He's worked in the public and NGO sectors for the first half of his 20-year career. Over the past decade, during the short periods when he was not busy studying the legacy of ancient contemplative traditions in Asia, he worked with companies as an independent consultant. He's a dynamic public speaker, as I may have hinted at earlier, with extensive experience in TV, journalism, PR, and organizational change. His immersion in traditional mind training practices over the course of 10 years, part of it also as a Buddhist monk, has led him to join the ranks of the SIY certified teachers with the SIY Leadership Institute. So what did we get to on the podcast? Well, the podcast was really about the topic of mindfulness, but we talk about Marco's origins from PR firm to his time as a monk. We get into the neuroscience behind mindfulness and different Buddhism traditions. We talk about Google and sort of how the SIY connection comes through. And then we walk through at the end what was supposed to be a three-minute exercise. We actually carried on for a little bit longer, but I know you're going to enjoy it. So set aside about eight to 10 minutes for that one. And that's just an exercise in mindfulness. And it's something that I've been actually playing ever since Marco ran me through it on the show. The show notes for this one are at decodingsuperhuman.com slash EQversity. That's E-Q-V-E-R-S-I-T-Y. Enjoy my episode with the fabulous Marco Lepic. Go, welcome to the show. Hey, Boomer. Uh, glad to be here. So we met a couple of weeks ago at the Biohacking Latvia conference, and you absolutely crushed it on stage. Oh, it, like amazing presentation. And so I wanted to have you on the show to talk a little bit about your topic. So first off, thank you for that presentation. But today we're going to go into a little bit of mindfulness. And surprisingly, it's something we've covered very little on the show, but it's because I've wanted to have a very knowledgeable guest on it. So I'm looking forward to this a lot. Well, thank you, Boomer, for your kind words. Um, I did my best and uh, it's a topic that really excites me. So I'm, I'm happy to share it in a way that's hopefully accessible to people and it makes sense and it it doesn't bring any unnecessary associations so it's my pleasure to share what i know let's start with your background because you haven't always been in the mindfulness field in fact you were in a very different field uh, to start do you mind just walking us through your journey to finding mindfulness Okay, um, I'll try to keep this one brief. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tell um, me your life story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tell me your life story and everybody will fall asleep. So long story short, um, about 15 years ago, up until 10 years ago, I was doing PR. And so the last job that I had, I was doing political PR. And as you can imagine, this is very fast paced. And this was in an era where um, people who ran PR departments 
would kind of have the same pressure of information load as people nowadays have all over the place. That was exclusive to us. And so at some point, um, the speed got so high that I think I kind of approached burnout. I don't really know if what happened was a burnout, but basically it got to be too much. So I pulled the plug and I got out. And so um, I put a little break on my PR career. And well, later turned out that the uh, break turned out to be um, not a little break, but uh, more like um, I decided not to do that anymore. And so after that happened, kind of a cliche, I decided to uh, reinvent a few things. And I ended up going to, um, as stereotypical as it is, to Asia. And I uh, ended up bumping into the traditional ways of mind training, which traditionally is done by Buddhist monks kind of on the Olympic level. And so having an academic background and a skeptical mind and coming from one of the most secular countries, I went to a retreat. I did a 10-day retreat. I think I came straight from a party the first time. And where, where, where was the retreat? That was in Thailand. Mm -hmm. and, and basically it blew my mind because what I experienced was like 10 days it was like five years of psychotherapy in 10 days without knowing I needed it. And so my question was, what is it? Why does it work? I knew nothing about it. Why does it work? Which part of this is placebo? Which part is brainwashing? Uh, which part is faith? What, what have you? So I set out to find out. I wanted to know what's going on. So that's what I've been doing for the past eight, nine or 10 years. That's the short version of the story. Okay, so I know a little bit longer version of the story, and there's some things I want to double click on because, uh, you know, for the past 10 years, you started your journey in Thailand. At what point, or how did you take it to, how did you investigate some of those questions you were asking yourself? Because, you know, what part of this is BS? What part of this is you know, not not real, but what part of this is rational? How did you start investigating that? So you and me, we met at a biohackers conference, right? So mm -hmm. these are people who are open to making all sorts of either reasonable or unreasonable experiments on themselves. Yeah. And so I kind of did the same, but on the mental level uh, with myself. So basically I sat tens and tens of retreats at first, um, different styles of it in Thailand and Myanmar. And eventually I came to the conclusion that, okay, um, I want to dig a bit deeper and I kind of want to take it to the next level and see how, <laughs> it's a bit hard to explain, but kind of to see how it's done and why are there some people who dedicate their lives to it. And again, mm -hmm. Uh, your question was how to separate from what's BS and what's not. I felt that for this, I really need to go into the machine and see mm -hmm. what's going on in the traditional setting. Because in the beginning, I actually didn't know, let's be honest, 10 years ago, I didn't know that the party of mindfulness, as it's used in the field of psychology nowadays, uh, and in psychotherapy, that this party had started 20 or 30 uh, years before. I just wasn't mm -hmm. aware. And as I went, I slowly learned that, oh, my God, um, you know, get your ballroom dancing shoes on and, and join the party because it's on. But honestly, I didn't quite trust at that time what had happened with the Western mindfulness movement. I was a bit skeptical because I saw, saw a lot of enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so my approach was experimentation on myself and trying to see what happens if you do it for the traditional way? And then, um, then looking back at the Western language of it, the way neuroscience and psychology look at it and, and different organizations who even take it to corporations like one I'm associated with called the Search mm -hmm. Inside Yourself Leadership Institute that uses the format which was actually developed at Google. So only then, when I had seen the traditional way, did I feel comfortable enough to look at what the West had kind of done 
with the notion of mindfulness because it's taken so many forms and it it's become fluffy at times even. Oh yeah. And and there's enough of that in traditional settings which which was a bit difficult for me to be near anyway, but it was the best kind of way to gain access to to this kind of old wisdom and there's a reason these uh, different looking containers let's say exist and they are very supportive. And so then basically I turned around and looked, okay, what does neuroscience say? What does, why is it that modern psychology is using mindfulness-based interventions to help people who have depression or anxiety or PTSD and, and they're using it successfully and sometimes either together with medication, sometimes without medication and getting equal or better results in terms of preventing relapse, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know if that answers your question, but kind of that was the route I came through. And perhaps you can guide me here of what's useful. Oh, oh, oh I'm, I'm going to, uh, because there's, there's many things that I, I, I want to ask out of this. So when we're talking about traditional practices, what does that consist of? Because I think there are going to be more than a number of people listening to this that are picturing a certain image, right? And so if you don't mind, I want to dispel that image or confirm it maybe um, and just sort of walk through what is a traditional uh, practice that you were doing in Thailand, Myanmar actually consist of? Both beautiful places, by the way. Yeah, so I mean, that's actually um, a difficult question in the sense that there's a, there's a simple answer for it of what I was doing and what is done nowadays. And then there are many layers anthropologically, um, many layers to that, that answer. But essentially the way it's done now is that you go to um, either a training center, a meditation center or, and, or a monastery. And basically you, you train your mind, you do a mind training exercises of various kinds day and night basically you know um some of these places have people meditating 12 hours a day um some are milder eight hours a day some are harsher they go up to 20 hours a day i mean there's different ways but basically you focus on various modalities of mind training as they've been passed mm -hmm. on and basically it's it's kind of some people like to say it's like science um Having had some science training, I'm a bit skeptical of that claim, but it's very, the mindset is very closely related to science in that mm -hmm. it's giving you tools and then it's giving you a certain set of hypotheses and you set out to test them out inside yourself. And so why I'm mm -hmm. saying it's not exactly science is that introspection is not something you can replicate exactly within another person or measure. Mm -hmm. But basically what happens is that you test, as you test out the, the hypothesis, you, things will unfold and you'll see what works for you, what doesn't, and what gets confirmed, what not. It's kind of a slow way. So essentially what you do is you, you do different kinds of either attention training or open awareness training, or there's, there's other kinds of exercises. So, so some of which are nowadays used again, as I said, in therapy or even corporate, uh, corporate training. Okay. So when you're going through this process, it's now, you know, we're 10 years back and you've done your first retreat. How long did it take for you to see progress? And I guess defining progress as sort of um, feeling better or more mindful, having more presence. Um, how long did that take? Because there are a lot of people here that have tried meditation and tried different processes and they get frustrated because they think that they should have a clear mind right away. Right. So this is a tricky question because mm -hmm. we all have different backgrounds and we will all have different experiences at different speeds. But I think what I can share is that A, it's not about experiences that's really important. B, it's about expectations. So what happens with Westerners is that we have wrong expectations of the process. We we mm -hmm. kind of take a kung ho approach to it, an expression I've heard in English. 
And basically, we kind of approach this process with the same mentality as we approach business, is that we try to achieve something, we set a goal, and then we do a lot of work to get it. And it's kind of a, the opposite process to that. So if we do that, the process gets longer and we get stuck. And so I'm, I'm a bit hesitant to kind of uh, give a clear answer on how long it takes. But um, what I can say is that it's an encouraging thing. So part from my experience, but from, part from research, is that research says that even 10 minutes of practice, if, if done in a continuous way, can kind of bring some benefits of the practice already within, within weeks. You don't have to do it for years. Although when you do it for years, of course, the, the changes will be more stable. But what I can say from personal experience is that once the attitude gets adjusted, whether that takes five days, seven days, or five years, then something will change. It's just up to each one of us. If we get good instruction in terms of why are we doing this? It's a really good question to ask. Like, why am I sitting down to do this thing? Is it curiosity? Is it desperation? Am I trying to get something? And, and also checking the attitude. And so basically, in traditional ways of teaching, there are entire schools where I've been to one place in Burma um, where they basically take Western people and they see that we are so goal-oriented that the entire practice revolves around getting the idea of working hard and getting a reward out of the equation, getting us to relax. So it's a completely different approach. And then it's up to each one of us, you know, how long does it get to hammer it into our head? And there are, of course, other places that are quite harsh. For example, I like to listen to um, Sam Harris's podcast, Making Sense. And um, I partly trust him because he has set some of the same retreats um, that I have. And so some other places are really hardcore. I believe he's been to one of those that do not take this kind of approach with Westerners. And what that leads to is that a Westerner takes the instruction and then applies the same kind of push, and that just creates problems and tension. And, and if, if you end up with a wise instructor, then they'll tell you that if you continue like that, at best, you know, you'll get a headache. At worst, things will get really bad. Um, so, you know, I'm, as you see, I'm going around in circles a bit. I'm reluctant to give a number because... It will. It can give people a wrong impression of what it's about. Of course. Uh, any particular style that is? I asked you this question over email um, because I'm very curious. But also, if, if you don't mind talking about some of the practices that you've gone through and sort of their effects on uh, building resilience uh, and mindfulness in general, like is there any particular? domain um, that tends to or that has worked well for you so yeah as we we kind of started out and went into my own story but i'm, I'm personally more interested in in kind of the options out there mm -hmm. so what worked for me was kind of conservative um, early buddhist approach to my training so that means theravada buddhism which which is being preserved in Myanmar, or formerly Burma, Thailand, Sri Lanka, a little bit in Laos, um, and a little bit in Cambodia. And um, it's taken a, a strong foothold in the West nowadays as well, England, US, um, Germany. But it's, it's interesting, it's relatively unknown in the West. Mm -hmm. um, but this is kind of the, the tradition that uses the earliest available text of the Buddhist tradition, and so it made sense to me, we're Westerners, um, it seemed highly compatible with the rational mindset. There's a limit to it, but it seemed highly compatible. And it made sense to me to choose first the earliest possible tradition on the Buddhist landscape, and second, the one with the least added cultural baggage and fluffy stuff. 
Mm -hmm. because they are different Buddhisms. Um, I'll, I'll use the plural here. And they have taken very different approaches. And of course, different things work for different people. But for me, something bare bones, back to the basics, worked. And there's, again, traditions within there. And why? Because, you know, these are very old traditions. And if we want to approach it at least semi-rationally, then knowing that all these things always get cultural influences mixed in, and that could be an entire podcast, um, the lowest common denominator um, seems to make sense to me. So nobody has kind of refuted or disputed the earliest texts, which the Theravadan tradition is based on, and the other ones do have kind of newly added things from 10th century, even 15th century. So it didn't make any sense for me as a Westerner to go and study something that somebody has made up in another country mm -hmm. um, you know, a thousand years later, a thousand five hundred years later, than when the original thing was kind of um, initiated. And within the Theravadin Buddhist tradition, um, the kind of known tradition in the West is the insight medita meditation tradition. Mm -hmm. Um, some of the leading names of that are Jack Kornfield and Joseph Goldstein and, and there's others. Um, and then, of course, many people have done um, a Vipassana retreat, which, uh, which has many styles, but uh, one particular style has become more known among some people, so as, as taught by S.N. Gwenka. Mm -hmm. It's quite rigid. There are milder ways of doing Vipassana. That may be um, complete news to many people because many have been led to believe there's only one way. Yeah. And within that, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I was just like, when you say Vipassana retreats, it's very popular in, among the California crowd these days. And I'm picturing 10-day silent retreats, but um, I'm sure, I'm hoping that there's others that are a little bit more accessible. Yeah, it's a good standard, the 10-day mm -hmm. retreat. There are 7-day retreats, there are even 5-day, there are 21-day, there are 28-day, there are 60-day and there are 90-day, you know. And wow. Yeah, I mean, as you get serious, you'll, you'll, you want to commit some <laughs> months. But again, this is the Olympic Games. This is not necessary for somebody running a small business or trying to uh, raise a family. Mm-hmm. Um, so what I was saying was that, and within that tradition, what really resonated with me after a lot of trial and error with kind of a focused attention practices, I happen to have a very fast mind that thinks a lot. And doing focus practices with that was actually not giving me very good results. Mm -hmm. And and my situation was getting not better, as the word you used before, I think, but actually kind of worse. And so it's until I bumped into open awareness practices that kind of teach one to relax a bit more. And and therapists use both, for example, mm -hmm. nowadays. And a program that uh, I mentioned, um, the one born at Google, that I also um, so I'm certified to teach myself, we use a combination of both. Um, okay. So this was really um, important for me to bump into these other ways of working, because very often people get hung up on... On, on one way of practice and mm -hmm. think that this is it. But it's basically like, you know, a shed of tools. There's a toolbox. And, and if you only learn to use the hammer, then everything becomes a nail, you know, this old story. Absolutely. But there's a saw and there's an electric drill and there's many things. So if you don't mind, I, I want to talk a little bit about Google and sort of how they got into this, because I, I love this story and I know you're intimately involved with it. Uh, do you mind just talking to me about how you found the program, but also you've mentioned some aspects of the program. If you don't mind explaining open awareness and what that practice is, it would be really helpful. Okay, so... Um, That's multiple need, questions need, in one, by the way. Yeah, so um, I'll need to make sure that I'll address um, both of them. So first of all, um, indeed, Google was one of the companies who and I'll keep this one short, who, who found at some point that having people train their minds or train their attention and training their mind essentially is what meditation means. Forget all the other definitions. We can even have two minutes for that later if it's interesting. But essentially, traditionally, it just means cultivating, training the mind. <laughs> they saw that it helps. 
It helps people to work better, live better. Um, it inspires them. And also, you know, if people are happier, they they work better as teams. So at first they started in small groups. And the guy who started is, was one of the first guys, one of the first employees at Google, um, Chade uh, Mengtan. And eventually people started approaching it and saying that, what is it that you do? You know, can you teach it to others? So as years passed by, they they had really good networks. So they put together a program together with the leading psychologists from Stanford and neuroscientists, right? Richard, like Richard Davidson and, and many others. Um, and they put together a program that specifically addresses the needs of a workplace. And so it became so successful inside Google that some years ago, uh, they decided to kind of outsource it or create a, um, a foundation or an NGO. So there is a nonprofit organization in San Francisco now called the Search Inside Yourself Leadership Institute, um, which does those trainings in various organizations, NGOs, governmental organizations, universities, or, or companies, also inside Google and inside SAP, for example, or SAP. And so this is one version of it, which, which has been tailored to the stresses of work life. And it's not so much a mindfulness program in and of itself, but it uses mindfulness as a building block, as a tool to develop and cultivate emotional intelligence. Um, and so, and then again, from there on leadership skills and many things like that. So it's multi-layered. Mm -hmm. um, this is a bit more than in therapeutical settings, but you had the other question, which was a completely different one about open awareness. Yeah. So, so, so open awareness practice or open awareness practices and I'll use completely my own words here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if, 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 I, if I misphrase something, you know, it's, it's, everybody knows that it's just uh, me making it up. I'm not reading official definitions. So people usually know focused attention practices. They know that you take an anchor or a point of attention and you focus on that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is not open awareness practice. This is, let's say you take uh, the breath. It works really well for many people because it's always with you. You try to keep your attention with this one object. Some people have experimented with, with other things. There are traditions that use repeating an idea or, or a word inside your head or staring at a dot on the wall. Or There's many, many ways. And, uh, you know, as, as many as we can make up, essentially. But the point there is to keep the mind occupied with one object. Uh, one one concept, one would even say. Now, open awareness practices are practices that you kind of settle in to your attention and then you let any sense perceptions that come in to your five senses just to come in. So if there's sounds, there's just sounds. You just take note of it, but you don't try to do anything with it. If your attention goes to a sight it's just a sight and you don't necessarily do anything with it. You know, if there's a smell, okay, you take note of the fact, you let it be, and that's it. Whereas in a focused attention training, what you'd normally try to do is that, let's say you're trying to follow your breath as your anchor or home base. So the training then is that if a distraction comes in the form of a sound or a sight or a smell, you take note of it, but then you return to a main focal point your anchor, the breath. And so in that case, the sound will be a distraction. But if you do an open awareness practice, nothing is a distraction. Everything is a welcome part of, of kind of training your ability to be aware or be with whatever stimuli comes to your organism. I wouldn't, like, I'm not sure if it's a good idea to start out like that. Mm -hmm. It might suit some people, but, um, but, um, for some people that really get stuck in their head and hung up in their head and seem to get really tight and very restless with the other ways of practice, um, I've heard and I've seen and I've experienced myself that mixing in a bit of open awareness practices and maybe, you know, learning more about it 
um, can really help. And, you know, in the end, it's a, it's a dance. Like if you've seen the movie Matrix, the moment when Neo um, starts dodging the bullets. I don't know if you remember that scene. Uh, you're, you're talking about one of my favorite movies of all time. Okay. So, <laughs> it's... so that moment when he do- starts dodging the bullets, and that's actually how I see essentially the practice, especially in everyday life. I mean, stuff comes, stuff will keep happening and... And until we're superhuman, you know, uh, like your podcast says, uh, we will get triggered also emotionally. So we'll learn to kind of learn to dance with that or like surf it, you know, like surf the waves. And I I really like that that episode in Matrix because as the bullets come, Neo will see them and just dodge them. Yeah. And Mm -hmm. so that that's like a metaphor that that resembles one kind of practice that I've really enjoyed. But, you know, it's just one and it's not always the one that's helpful because, again, many times people actually need practices to calm themselves. Mm -hmm. And so calm can arise as a side effect of many practices, but but it cannot be the goal. The goal of, of mindfulness practices, whichever ones they are in the modern Western sense, is to become accepting of what arises and in a kind compassionate manner and that's mm-hmm. pretty pretty much about it the traditional way, definitions of mindfulness are a little bit different but i think that's not the prime interest uh, today but basically learning to to be with whatever arises and accepting it and 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 then moving on and therapy often adds to this based the phrase based on your values so there's a really interesting book called The Happiness Trap. Mm-hmm. It's a therapy book um, that actually it's a, like a handbook for acceptance and commitment therapy. And there's many exercises and little hacks there for, for somebody who is struggling with anxiety or depression, for example. And a disclaimer here, I am not a therapist and I do not have a psychology education. Just just so people know. We're just uh, sharing information. Yes. So... My, my my master's degrees have been done in, in governance, government and public policy. So mm-hmm. it's a different field. But this book also in the other half leads to clarifying one's values. And it's really odd at first. And we actually do the same thing in the SIY and the Search Inside Yourself program as we, as we uh, teach people self-awareness and self-regulation and then social skills. Because what we often do not know is that our emotional material is, first of all, and that's going to sound crazy, especially for men, and I understand there's probably quite a lot of guys listening to this podcast. Ah. So brace yourself. I'm going to say a weird sentence, and, and, and I invite you to find out if you can find if this is true. So first, emotions are physical. And that's one. Yeah. And, and, and then I'll add a second. And so these physical sensations, as they manifest in the body, constantly bring us signals of how the body or the organism perceives that it's being threatened or flattered based on the underlying value system that we have. And this is really cool and interesting stuff. And that's an angle that it's very hard to come across on one's own. Some people do. But basically... Basically, it actually makes sense that, you know, if something triggers anger in us or jealousy or something, very often it's actually an underlying indication that our organism feels threatened Mm -hmm. if we get triggered by anger. And so we get the corresponding emotional response. And so what mindfulness practice, whichever way it's done, really, what what it allows us to do is to step back from that reactionary way of dealing with with emotional responses and we don't have to say that i am angry but we can come to a completely new ground and we can say that oh okay this trigger happened and i'm feeling this rush of blood to my head and this contraction in my stomach and my fists are spontaneously getting ready to fight and my shoulders are tight oh i am experiencing anger in my body and it's like a shift from from existential of I am anger or I am angry to kind of experiential of, oh, I'm experiencing this emotion. 
and kind of the stepping back is is the trick there. And so it's really a question of finding a way to get that message home. And that's why, like you said, um, your podcast listeners have tried different practices and not everything will work for everybody. And And honestly, sometimes I've come to the conclusion that sometimes a mixture of of the Eastern wisdom with the Western research language, the kind of empirical evidence-based language makes the best sense for Western minds because we've been cultured and raised in a certain way and educated. So we understand some things better when they're explained to us in a language familiar to us. So that's why I mentioned the, the Happiness Trap book, for example, because I, I really didn't like the book because I, I thought they'd taken some of the exercises from, from traditional places and never giving the credit. But at the same time, some of the exercises were really silly, but really, really effective. So mm -hmm. I just thought I'd share that. But I saw you wanted to say something before. No, no, no. This is brilliant because emotions are physical. It makes a lot of sense when you start to look at cortisol and just general response. A lot of what you said reminds me of the work of Viktor Frankl in some ways, or at least that that moment where you can pause and then react, and that's the moment that we have control over. But, oh man, there's so much stuff I want to go into here. If you're going to take this and, and say to people I, that want to get started but have no clue where to start, what kind of experiment should they start with? Okay, that's a big question. Um, so I'll share opinions. Please, <laughs> I'm always please. very, yeah. very re reluctant to be normative. Um, so I assume many people listening to this podcast have tried one app or another. Um, still, apps seem to be a good gateway for many people. But I also know people who, I know people who love Headspace. Mm -hmm. And then I know people who tried it for a long period and it didn't really give them the leap or the momentum. Okay. And uh, you included, yeah? Yeah. And so, and, and I just spoke to a, a, a serial entrepreneur, a, a, a chronicle startupper that I know. And this, it really didn't work for him. And we had a chat about a year or two ago in Helsinki, Finland. And I kind of try to explain some of the other concepts of, of trying to learn to see your thoughts and see, like witness your emotions. You know, I, I know it sounds crazy stuff. And I would have, you know, 10 years ago, I would have punched somebody in the face if they would have said that to me. Okay, actually, I wouldn't. I'm not a fighter type, but it, I would have gotten really irritated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, blood pressure going up. But, but the point is, it's possible. And so the reason I'm now talking about it openly without the fear of being considered a loony bin is that we now have validation for it from, from psychological research. Mm -hmm. And it's really helpful. And so he then bumped into, again, the app by Sam Harris called Waking Up. And this app really takes it to a completely le different level. Like Sam really tries to get to the core of of some of the stuff that's causing us to get hung up and that's causing our, our problems. Again, I can't say if it fits everybody. So apps are, are one way. There's other apps. One is Calm. I think Calm just made it to Unicorn. I'm not sure. Uh, there's Insight Timer with guided meditations. And there's many others. We can make a whole list. Mm -hmm. But the other way to answer your question is that how could one start experimenting is to actually... One way is to forget all the apps and to go back to the bench and make it simple. Uh, maybe we'll do a short little practice later. And, and it might be possible to just to try that for a while. So basically is to use, again, let's say one's breath as the anchor point for trying to catch the attention. And just to do that 10 minutes a day. You know, I know I've, I've, I've done it. Like um, I've set goals of like, I'll do it for two hours. I'll do it for three hours. I'll do it for one hour. I mean, at some point, I even, you know, thought that I'll, I'll become a monk for many, many years and I'll, I'll do this really hardcore. But in the end, 
very often it turns out that there is a wrong intention behind this attitude. And so stepping off of the high horse <laughs> that, you know, I'll do this thing, I'll get it, really helps. And just, you know, in, in Zen Buddhism, they have this saying, the beginner's mind. I've, I've heard it. I've heard it in modern podcasts as well. Kind of every time you start the practice, just starting over, like I've achieved nothing. I don't know anything. I'll just see with curiosity, what's the experiment going to be like today? I'm going to experiment. What happens if I try to settle my attention with my breath? That's it. Like, and it's a completely different attitude. Like you're not going to get anything out of it. You just sit down and you try to see, okay, what's it going to be like? Is it going to be like what I consider awful or is it going to be what I consider cool? Because these are both kind of concepts we make up because we have expectations. But as one practices, one will see that there's no such thing as a bad meditation session. Because you mentioned before that people find it difficult to steady the mind or make the mind calm. But, but the question is, who gave us the idea that this should be the goal? <laughs> that, that's actually a question I haven't thought about. Yeah, but that's a good, then it's an excellent question to yeah, ask. Yeah, exactly. So when did that storyline start in our heads that this should be the effect? It could be that because we're stressed and I mean our minds are in overdrive and information overload, we're scarce on time and we're hyper connected, etc. And so we want to have some kind of way out. And it's like, okay, what what are all these things? You know, you can try try drugs, I can, you can try microdosing, you can do food supplementation, you can do yoga, pilates, whatever things, and then oh, there's, there's all these meditation practices, all this crazy stuff, and etc, etc. So we try it out out of desperation, or some people do it out of curiosity. But really, where did the idea come from that it has to be calm? Yes, sometimes we will become calm. And when a calm mind happens, it can be really cool. But like I can, I can really say that about myself as well. If one has a rapidly thinking mind, and I'm afraid the more schooling you've done to yourself, and here I'm not making a mistake in English grammar, I'm using the words on purpose, the more you've done of that thing to yourself, probably the, the more difficult it might be to experience a calm mind because the mind is trained to think fast and make many connections. So when we sit down, what we're going to experience is the mind the way it is for us. Our mind happens to be fast thinking and not calm. Okay, where's the problem? Like, it's a completely different attitude we can take. And so I'll wrap that up by saying that one way to approach it is to start over. A really good teacher of mine in Burma, he at some point when I approached him with a question of, listen, I've been doing this practices now, this thing for, for years and stuff is getting exceedingly bad. And that's one of the reasons, because there can be side effects with wrong practice. And that was one of the reasons I was skeptical of some of the Western approaches at times. Because, just a disclaimer, because people with trauma can have actually unpleasant side effects from doing these practices, etc. And then he listened to me and he was quite busy and and um, I stopped him kind of not in line with the Eastern way of, of how you're supposed to talk with a teacher kind of on the road and stuff. But but because I had to leave that place, I had to take that shot. I had traveled so many thousands of kilometers or miles and he just told me, if it's like that, just stop. It's best you don't meditate. Stop. That's it. And so basically taking the same attitude every every morning or afternoon, trying that. Okay, I'll try where it goes. And, and completely rebuilding the idea of what success and failure are like. I don't know if that answered your question. Oh, of course it did. And in so many different levels, that was great. We've talked and danced around this idea of an exercise. And you walked everybody through one in in Riga that was brilliant if you don't mind I'd love to take the audience just through a, a simple exercise right now that people can do every day all right the sponsor for today's podcast is a member of the toolkit that I use on an almost daily basis to upgrade my state of being and have used it actually for the past couple of years 
The guys over at Neurohacker Collective have done a fantastic job. You've heard me rave about the original stack as well as quality of mind on the show. But now I'm so excited because the suite of products has grown. You have quality of focus for that near term bump. You have quality of mind caffeine free for all my caffeine sensitive listeners out there. But their latest product, which just came out, is oh so exciting. It's called Eternus, and it's a 38 ingredient formula containing the most researched and premium ingredients on earth for supporting cellular health. This is key to combating the symptoms of aging. If you want to check out Eternus, Quality of Mind, Focus, or any of the Neurohacker products, go over to neurohacker.com and plug in the code BOOMER. You'll get an additional 15% off your order. Enjoy. So what do you think is the tolerance level in terms of minutes? Is it one minute or two minutes or three minutes? Oh, we can, we can do three to five, whatever you're comfortable with. Um, okay. So if the people listening to the podcast are okay, um, I'll kind of budget for, for, you know, two to five minutes then. Let's see where it goes. I'm not going to time it or script it. Yeah. But Perfect. basically we can do... A basic attention training. And before we start, can I explain a little thing? So basically, the idea of that is that as we train our attention, yeah, and this is what what many of us who share these practices with people mean when we say meditation. That's it. As we train attention, it's like going to the gym. And when we do a dedicated practice in the gym, what, we, what do we do there in resistance trainings? We do reps, right? So, in this practice, we will use an anchor for attention, which is the breath. But I'm just inviting a, a new thought, hopefully, for some people, that it's not a problem if the mind wanders off to a sound or to a thought, but as it wanders off, we've just basically noticed what's a neurotic monkey mind. You know, we're just neurotic apes in some sense after all, and that's not my original idea. What the mind has been trained to do, and we're even wired for that in some extent. So it's not a problem. It's more like, oh, the mind is doing its thing. How about I discover that? I've discovered that now. Oh, and in a kind way, I'll put my monkey back to where I would like it to be for the next one minute or 10 seconds, back to that anchor or center of attention. And why I'm talking about the gym is that that's one rep. So there's no problem if the mind is scattered and rushing, but essentially it does what it does. It runs off and we are now training, you know, like a dog or a child, they don't want to stay put. You know, we don't also want to stay put. So now we're training a new skill. So basically thinking about it as reps. When the mind wanders off, we'll bring it back. And whenever we've brought it back, that's the moment of success. That's one rep. So we'll get constant feedback, you know, like uh, if you want to hack flow, mm -hmm. if you have a constant feedback and sufficient challenge, you can tap into flow. If that's done right, this can even be an opening to a pretty cool territory of flow without, you know, extreme sports. But... Mm -hmm. Not always, <laughs> and not to set that expectation up. Okay? Okay, so let's try how attention training works. So first of all, if the listener, if you, are deciding to take part, I invite you to find a comfortable position for yourself. So just finding a position where you are both relaxed, you don't have to tense your back, you don't have to tense your neck, and you're both relaxed but also alert. So if you feel a bit sleepy, and if you sit on a chair, maybe not supporting your back, if you feel sleepy. At the same time, if you feel really anxious right now, you could do the opposite, supporting your back, because it allows the body to relax. You know, finding out what works for you. So taking a few moments to find a comfortable position, And settling in to that. And just checking in what it feels like to sit on the chair.
sensing your buttocks, touch the chair. And maybe sensing your feet touching the ground. If you sit in another position, just sensing your feet touching whatever is under them in whichever way. And then opening your attention a bit and bringing your attention to any sounds that may be around you. And just maybe seeing how many sounds can you hear? Can you count three different sounds? And so opening up, if there's maybe any smells around you, one, two. And if your eyes are still open, checking in with the fact that you're seeing. What is it like to see right now? And so with that, I invite you to try to experiment with maybe closing your eyes. But if this is uncomfortable, you can keep them open and keep the gaze in front of you, like one and a half meters, slightly looking down. Both are okay. And we'll now try and settle our attention on our breath. So trying to find our breath, wherever we happen to feel it. So some people feel it at the nostrils, some at the upper lip as the air comes out. And some of you will feel the stomach rising and falling or the chest, just finding where it's most vivid for you and deciding that this is going to be the anchor point for this attention training exercise. That's what we're going to be doing the repetitions with, the reps. So settling your attention on your in-breath and your out-breath. And noticing that sometimes we may be constricting our breathing without being aware of it. You may also explore relaxing your shoulders and opening your chest. And just keeping your attention on the sensation of the breath going in and going out. And simply stopping, noticing your thoughts, your body, your feelings. What is it like to sit here right now? What does it feel like? And just see if you can be curious and open and interested. And perhaps as though you're noticing your breath for the first time. So this curiosity is key. So I'll pose an interesting question. How do you know that you are breathing? Can you notice the moment the in-breath begins? how it continues, 
and the moment it ends. Can you notice the moment the outbreath begins? How it continues? The moment it ends and the in breath begins again? So now, with your attention, can you follow one complete cycle of breath? And if your mind wanders, gently bringing it back to breathing and trying again. Breath going in, breath going out. And as the mind wanders, again with curiosity and kindness, it's like, aha, it's wandered off, and again inviting it back to where we would like it to be. So now, opening up your attention a little bit again and trying to see if there are any sounds in the room. Checking in what it's like to be sitting, if there's any tensions in the body, you've been sitting in one place. And you can gently open your eyes if they were closed and letting the lights in and seeing what it's like to see and just becoming aware of the fact that okay I'm seeing and so we're going to be ending the exercise but the last invitation is to experiment what it's like to continue listening with this sense that we kind of acquired through this exercise as we go. So not to think about the practice being over, but what it's like to keep kind of doing the same movement as we go through our everyday activities. So there basically isn't a difference between practice and life in that sense. And with that, the formal practice is over. So bringing your attention back to the podcast but trying to keep that attitude going underneath. Marco, this was incredible. I, I think I was telling you earlier that I messed up my calf muscle today, and this was exactly what I needed. Um, so, dude, this thank you. That was amazing. So can I ask you a question? Please. So what did you experience as a result of the short practice? You know, I was going to say calm, but that's probably not mm -hmm. the word given. Uh, just a general awareness and bringing my attention back to smaller things and more of a greater appreciation to those things. And what I mean, is, and I'm hoping you can't hear it, but like the neighbors outside, for instance, making noise and having an appreciation for that rather than being like, Hey dudes, I'm recording a podcast here. So right. that was that was very different than what I normally experience. So thank you. Okay, that's very cool. Because kind of the same question maybe for the podcast listener is that, you know, what was the experience like? And it can be very different. Some people sometimes say that they feel calmer. Some people unearth an underlying restlessness. And it's like very often it's a signal that maybe we need to take care of something because the restlessness has a cause, right? So there's no right answer for that. But it's just kind of 
the way you were describing it, Boomer, that you know you 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 were in some distress today because of the pain, and so some of these practices are like, for example, in the framework of of um, of MBSR, mindfulness based stress reduction, initiated by Jon Kabat Zinn, which is one of the most famous Western um, secular uh, mindfulness movements and approaches. They started out by working with people with chronic pain and kind of. This kind of thing of settling down and then allowing for the sensations to arise and be is the, the core of, of many of these practices. And of course, it can take many avenues. And uh, essentially, the point is the same. You know, where is your attention? Mm. And where would you like it to be? <laughs> exactly. Marco, if it's okay with you, I want to transition into some final four rapid fire questions. First off, Thank you for taking the time to be with us today. This exercise is incredible. And I know there's going to be many listeners out there that are going to get a lot out of it. So thank you. I got a lot out of it in real time. But with that, let's let's kick things off with a, a, a question that I think, I'm very curious of your answer to all of these actually. What is one area of performance that you think people should pay more attention to or should get more attention than is currently getting? So what is one area of performance that should get more attention from mm -hmm. people? Mm -hmm. So if, you, if your goal is to improve in performance, what area, okay. what area should people focus more on? My attention would be, you know, the same that we've been talking about. And this is why I've invested so much of, of my life into this over the past 10 years. And I think this is why Sam Harris talks about it, who has a much better platform, is where is your attention? And who controls your limited resource of your attention? And that seems to be underlying everything. Sports performance, business performance, you know. Are we in control of what we pay attention to? Or are we not? Is somebody making money off of directing our attention? You know, we have limited hours per every day. And so I think that's the first answer that comes to my mind. Um, and that seems to be the underlying decisive factor. Because if we are attentive to what's going on with us, that self-awareness, we can manage ourselves. We can manage very difficult emotions. And then we can learn to do the same with other people as they learn to manage themselves. So, short one, attention. Where is your attention? Beautiful. <clears throat> this may dovetail into the next question, but I ask that if you can pick something aside from mindfulness and your practice, uh, as you may call it, what is your own trick for enhancing your focus or your attention? So... One word, simplification. Mm, I think two words, mental diet. Okay. On the, the second one, what do you mean by mental diet? Yeah, that's another podcast. Let's do another one. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, basically, we get into murky waters here. But um, essentially... I, I, I tend to side with the people who say that everything we put into our organism um, affects us. And so, you know, the food you put into yourself will affect your health and performance. We know that. So in the traditional ways of looking at it, everything that goes into your body through your ears, nose, tongue and eyes is kind of mental food. It's a metaphor. So controlling what goes in. Like, for example, there's a movie that I really, really like. It's Guy Ritchie's Revolver. Um, the problem with that movie is that whilst it's really good, and many people have mistaken it for a really bad action movie, and it's a bad action movie, but it's something completely different. One has to watch a spoiler on YouTube called The Elevator Scene first, and then watch the movie. And he has managed to capture the way our mind works on the movie screen, it's it's crazy, but the movie has violence in it. And 
it's both graphic and implied. When it's graphic, it's kind of cartoonish, and when it's implied, it's quite tense. So what I do is that I've seen that movie a few times, and I'm hesitant to recommend it to people because of the violence, because I do side with those people who say that it'll leave an imprint. And so I don't watch the violent parts. I, When I watched Game of Thrones, I skipped the violence porn in it. Honestly, I don't need to see that. It's excellent storytelling. Mm -hmm. But all the stuff that trick that tickles our dark instincts, you don't need to feed it. Like, how about you feed the kindness in you? That doesn't automatically spring up when you see a beggar on the street. So things like that. That's what I mean by mental diet. What goes in? And so, you know, learning to see what steals our focus either externally or, in or internally, comes back to the previous question, right? Simplification. It's brilliant. I take it you didn't like the last two episodes of Game of Thrones then? Well, I watched them, um, but um, yeah, that's a, t a different topic. I, I, still <laughs> enjoyed, I still enjoyed them. I couldn't resist the addiction, I must uh, admit, because the story writing is so excellent. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you are correct in that there is a saturation point of the gore. And when it gets to just, just, just hacking for that pleasure, I don't look at that. Same with Westworld. Like, I think it is not healthy to just, um, di just consume th those images. Having said that, one is free to do that. But if your aim is to train your mind, and if your aim is to maybe experience a calmer mind, then what I say is valid. If you want to watch it, you can do whatever you want. But if you want to get fit, you need to watch your caloric intake, right? Mm -hmm. And do resistance training, etc. If you don't want to get fit in that way, you can eat whatever you want. I mean, it's not, it's not a moralistic talk. It's more like... It's, it's, it's the wisdom of what do you want to get? So if one wants to train the mind well, it matters what we eat in the sense, but mentally. Since the last time we spoke, you caused me to rack up quite an Amazon bill. And so I'm very much looking forward to this question. What book has significantly impacted your life and how you show up to perform in it? I apologize for uh, damaging your credit rating. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, I, I think, uh, and we'll all explain the books that you recommended if you don't okay. mention them here, but you first. So one that comes to mind is a famous book, Hero with a Thousand Faces by Joseph Campbell from 1949. He was an American professor of literature who studied world mythologies. And that book has profoundly impacted me in my own doings. And I, I chip in another one. And I think I didn't mention to yet that to you at the biohacking conference. Um, and that's a completely different avenue. So this one is called Imagined Communities. Uh, Reflections on the Origin and Spread of Nationalism by Benedict Anderson from 1983. And that is also a book, I think, for people from more like mono-ethnic um, nation states. I think everybody should read it. Um, I read it whilst I was studying in London. And England is one of the places where they like to study nationalism to pieces and the way it's it's really a governing instrument in some sense as well. And we're, and so for me, this book didn't leave like one, what's the English expression uh, of not a single brick upon another or something? Wow. that's That, that might remember. be a British expression because I... I I'm not sure. I yeah, I'm, off the top of I'm my not head. a native speaker, yeah. so you know the idioms get lost in translation sometimes. But basically, it was very impactful for me. It was academic reading. Mm -hmm. It's not an easy reading, but but a really cool book. And I, given the tendencies that we have now happening in the U.S. in America of 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 kind of patriotism being confused with nationalism, and 
and people really not understanding the origins and the concepts and different theories of nationalism, I think it's time to revisit that stuff because some of the politics that's happening in the US and, and in Europe and now Estonia, which was this poster child, and I am from Estonia, of like digital governance and e-government. And we just kind of screwed up with, with the last elections as well. We kind of joined some of the other Scandinavian countries who have let right-wing extremist views into the government. So congratulations. So it's really important to educate ourselves around that. So that's why I'm shipping that book in. Very powerful. And I knew when you mentioned Joseph Campbell at Biohacking uh, Latvia, I was like, okay, we're going to get along. This is going to be good. <laughs> Marco, where can people find out more about you? So... Um, you could visit my website. Um, I'll spell it out because I realize I might need a redesign of the website name because having to spell it. But so it's eqversity.com, mm -hmm. eq as in emotional intelligence and versity as the other half of university. So eqversity.com, one word. And so there um, you can find out information about um, the keynotes that I do. I also do... Um, full kind of trainings for teams um, in the format of SIY that I've been licensed in uh, by the Institute in San Francisco. So it's the same format that SAP uses, that, that uh, Google uses. And so I'm happy to share this stuff. It's really cool stuff. It's neuroscience-based, evidence-based, and we really tackle the workplace stresses and performance and ability to excel in what we do. So performance being the focus of this podcast as well. And then also um, team coaching gigs that I do. I mean, I currently do some work in, in the US, um, some in Lithuania, some in Finland, some in Estonia. So I, I mix in some of the self-awareness and self-management practices, but at the same time doing classical coaching of trying to get stuff done because under the stress that we you, you know, work, the, the stress we're under right now is what I meant to say. These self-regulation tools become more and more important in whatever we do. So eqversity.com. Excellent. And we'll link to all of this in the show notes, which we're going to be at decodingsuperhuman.com slash eqversity. Marco, thank you for spelling it. <laughs> but thank you so much for coming on the podcast because this has been exactly what I needed today. So thank you for this amazing conversation. Um, thank you, Boomer, for inviting me because I've taken great joy in this conversation and what we've spoken about. And it's a great honor to be on the podcast. So I wish good luck to you and all the listeners. And I hope to see some of you who you've only heard my voice now, but I hope to see you somewhere. Good luck. Superhumans, before you go, if you enjoy the episode, if you enjoy all of our episodes, head on over to iTunes and leave us a five-star rating. It would really, really help get the word out on what we're doing here at Decoding Superhuman. Feedback. If you want to give us direct feedback or you want to see us cover a specific topic, whether on the shorter episodes or the longer episodes, head on over to your email and email us at podcast at decodingsuperhuman.com. For those of you who have sent emails to that address, you know that I respond to every single one. And then lastly, would you like 300 to 500 words of highly curated information on how to upgrade performance? If so, head on over to decodingsuperhuman.com slash throwdown and you'll get our next issue of the throwdown, which is our 300 to 500 word highly curated digest, if you will, on what's going on in the field of performance. Enjoy your day, superhumans, and thank you from the bottom of my heart for tuning in to today's episode.